Hi everyone. So at this point in the course, we have just finished our discussions on the various classes of biomolecules that can exist in the cell. For our next segment of the course, we're now going to focus on enzymes. Um, we'll be spending time talking about classes of enzymes, enzyme mechanisms, as well as enzyme kinetics. So for this lecture specifically, we're going to be focusing on the basics of enzyme catalysis and we will be able to explore some various enzyme classes as well as some of the mechanisms in more detail. If you're following along in Voigt, Voigt and Pratt, we are focusing on Chapter 11. The content from this lecture will then be applied to our in-class activity from our workbook, S9. This activity is going to allow us to, one, apply our understanding of intermolecular forces to the rate enhancement for an enzyme catalyzed reaction. It will also allow us to, two, explain general acid-base catalyzed reactions and then apply that to an enzyme-governed reaction. Three, it will allow us to generalize our, generalize our understanding of rate enhancement on acid-base catalyzed reactions to other types of enzyme-mediated catalysis. And then finally, four, integrate our understanding of rate enhancement and rate-determining steps in the application to the delta G versus reaction coordinate diagram. So let's go ahead and get started. As you watch this video, please be sure to keep these learning objectives in the back of your mind. Meeting these learning objectives will help prepare us not only for our in-class activity, but also for our exam. Also, do not forget to post your muddiest point questions and answers to the discussion board after you have completed this video. So enzymes are proteins that can catalyze reactions in the cell. These molecules govern nearly all of the biochemical reactions in the cell and are able to speed up reactions by lowering the energy of activation. In our example here, reactants A and B react to give products P and Q. Although we can see that this reaction is exergonic and spontaneous, meaning that the energy level of the products is lower than that of the reactants, we have to first go through a transition state that has a large energy of activation, meaning although this reaction is overall favorable, it may take a long time to get the tr to the transition state. Enzymes, however, are able to stabilize the transition state, which decreases the energy of activation significantly and allows the reaction to occur much more quickly. So you may be asking yourself, how do enzymes do this? Well, there are some specific mechanisms that enzymes do employ in order to bring down the energy of activation that we will explore in a few minutes. But at the heart of all of these mechanisms, enzymes employ a specific arrangement of functional groups within an active site to promote specific interactions with the substrate. These stereospecifically arranged functional groups not only help to draw on the substrate, but can also trigger an induced fit in which a conformational change within the active site upon binding the substrate aids in the formation of the transition state of the substrate. There are a number of advantages to using enzymes in order to govern reactions, such as they allow for higher reaction rates, the ability to perform a reaction at milder conditions, such as under physiological conditions of the cell. We can also have greater reaction specificity through the utilization of enzymes, and we have a greater capacity for regulation. By utilizing inhibitors and activators, we can quickly control the rate of the enzymatic reaction. There are six basic enzymatic classifications, which are named after the types of reactions they catalyze. For instance, oxidoreductases perform oxidation reduction reactions. Transferases transfer functional groups. Hydrolases utilize hydrolysis reactions to break one molecule into two. Lysis does group elimination to form double bonds. Isomerases perform isomerization reactions, while ligases will couple two molecules in one to form a bond, typically utilizing ATP. Enzymes are very specific for their substrates. The active site is not only just a geometric match for the substrate, but is often an electronic and chemical match as well. In order to maximize hydrogen bonding, ionic interactions, and van der Waal contacts. 
while the active site is largely preformed to the substrate, we actually undergo some conformational changes within the active site upon binding, which is called an induced fit. It is believed that the induced fit brought on upon the correct substrate is what spurs the enzyme to begin pushing the substrate towards the transition state in order to catalyze the reaction. An analogy I like to use is to think about a glove on the table. It has mostly the shape of a hand, but once you put your hand in it, the shape changes in order to fit your hand perfectly. As you recall from chapter four, the building blocks of enzymes, which are amino acids, are themselves chiral. Therefore, enzymes are also stereospecific too, which gives them the ability to be very specific for their substrates. As you recall from some of our conversations about our ability to break down only D sugars and not L sugars, well, that's because our enzymes cannot recognize the L conformation. In the L conformation, the sugar would have its hydroxyl groups pointed in the opposite direction than what the enzyme active site is designed for. Enzymes can often use other small molecules in order to carry out their function, and these are called cofactors. Cofactors can be either metal ions, such as iron or sodium, or they can be organic molecules, such as ATP or NADH. If a cofactor is transient, meaning it is not covalently bound to the enzyme and can come off and on the enzyme, then it is considered a co-substrate. If the cofactor, however, is permanently bound to the enzyme through covalent bonds, then it is called a prosthetic group. If we were to consider hemoglobin, both the heme and the iron atom in hemoglobin are considered prosthetic groups. When the enzyme does not have its cofactor, we consider it inactive, and it is called the apoenzyme. Upon addition of the correct cofactor, though, we have an active enzyme called the holoenzyme. One thing to keep in mind, unlike the enzyme itself, the cofactor must be regenerated after the reaction. A good example of this is ATP, which is often hydrolyzed to ADP during a reaction. In order to repeat the reaction with the new substrate, a new molecule of ATP must be recruited, and eventually the cellular stock of ATP must be regenerated through oxidative phosphorylation. Zymogens are a unique category of enzyme. After synthesis, these enzymes, the proenzyme, are inactive and only activate after proteolytic cleavage of a piece of the polypeptide chain. A classic example of a zymogen is trypsin, in which the proenzyme trypsinogen is cleaved by either enteropeptidase or another molecule of active trypsin near the N terminus to make a small peptide in the active form of trypsin. This is a great strategy that allows the cell to have a large number of enzymes at the ready that can be quickly turned on when needed or where needed. This is typically seen in digestive enzymes such as trypsin. In the trypsin example, trypsinogen is stored in the pancreas, and when we eat, it is transported into the stomach in which the presence of enteropeptidases will cleave and activate trypsin. And then both activated forms of trypsin and enteropeptidases can then activate more molecules of trypsin as they are added to the stomach. Again, as I mentioned previously, enzyme catalysis works by stabilizing the transition state of the reaction, thereby reducing the activation energy needed for the reaction to occur. By doing this, we can greatly increase the rate of the reaction. Because we are stabilizing the transition state through the use of an enzyme, we now have what seems more like a stable intermediate, making our one-step reaction more of a two-step reaction, in which A goes through a transition state to the intermediate, and then the intermediate goes through a transition state to make the product. There are two possibilities now for a rate-determining step. Either A can have a higher energy of activation to make its transition state and be the rate determining step, or the intermediate can have a higher ener energy of activation and it can be the rate determining step. I have seen cases for both, but often it is the first step uh, in which A goes to the intermediate that is our rate determining step. However, we can only determine this through experimentation. 
As you remember, I had mentioned previously that there are a number of catalytic mechanisms that an enzyme can employ, and often enzymes utilize more than one. For example, in acid-base catalysis, we have a transition state that is stabilized through the donation or acceptance of protons to or from the substrate. In covalent catalysis, a covalent bond is formed between the enzyme and the substrate to stabilize the transition state. In metal ion catalysis, metal ions are used to bind to the substrate to orient it properly, mediating oxidation reduction reactions and electrostatically stabilizing or shielding negative charges on the transition state. Proximity and orientation effects bring two substrates within close proximity and orients them for the reaction. This is specifically helpful when we're talking about substrates in the cell that are very, very low concentration in comparison to other compounds within the cell. Preferential binding of the transition state complex allows the enzyme to bind the transition state of a reaction with greater affinity than that of the substrate or the product. As classic examples of substrate specificity is the enzyme class proteases. Proteases cleave peptide bonds after very certain amino acids, and this specificity is driven by what can fit into the binding pocket. In chymotrypsin, we have a large, mostly hydrophobic pocket in which we can fit large, bulky aromatic rings, allowing chymotrypsin to cleave specifically after phenylalanine or tyrosine. Trypsin however, trypsin, however, has a deep, shallow pocket with a negatively charged aspartic acid residue at the bottom. This pocket is a perfect fit for lysine, in which the lysine residues can fit into and interact through their positively charged amino groups. Elastase has a very shallow and hydrophobic pocket that is perfect for alanines and glycines. While each protease may have a different binding pocket to help orient specific amino acids into the active site of the enzyme, they all share a common mechanism called the serine protease catalytic triad. It is called the serine catalytic triad because it involves three amino acids, serine 185, histidine 57, and aspartic acid residue 102, which can work in concert to bind and cleave the peptide bond of the substrate. Let's take a look at this step by step. In the absence of a substrate, the aspartic acid residue is forming a hydrogen bond with histine 57. Histine 57 is then oriented where the unprotonated nitrogen of histidine is near the hydroxyl group of serine. Under normal conditions, serine would not lose the hydrogen from its hydroxyl group until around pH 13. However, hydrogen bonding interactions between histidine and serine help make the oxygen atom on serine more reactive. Once the substrate for the protease enters the binding pocket and positions the carbonyl carbon of the peptide bond within the vicinity of that reactive serine oxygen, serine will then lose its hydrogen to histidine and the oxygen with serine will perform a nucleophilic attack to the carbonyl carbon to form a tetrahedral intermediate resulting in a covalent bond between the peptide and the serine. In the next step of the reaction, the nitrogen within the peptide bond then acts as a general acid to attack the hydrogen from histidine, breaking down the tetrahedral, tetrahedral intermediate. And we now have an acyl enzyme intermediate with the C-terminus end of the peptide still bound to the enzyme and a new N-terminus of the cleave polypeptide chain is now free to exit the active site. In step three, the new amine product is released and is replaced by a molecule of water. The water molecule can then undergo acid-base catalysis by losing a hydrogen to histidine, followed immediately by a nucleophilic attack of the oxygen to the carbonyl carbon of the peptide, forming a second tetrahedral intermediate. In step five, a general acid catalysis aids in the breakdown of the tetrahedral, where the oxygen on serine grabs the proton from histidine, breaking the bond between serine and the carbonyl. The C-terminus end of the cleave polypeptide is now able to exit the active site. And as you can see, we have regenerated our enzyme.
In this example alone of a serine protease, we are able to see how an enzyme could employ a number of different mechanisms from orientation and proximity to position the peptide bond near the catalytic triad to general acid-base catalysis through the use of histidine and water and covalent catalysis through a covalent bond between serine and the peptide that was able to stabilize two different tetrahedral intermediates. In class, we will be working on activity S9 from the workbook, which will allow us to explore both the differences in the energy of activation with and without an enzyme for various reactions, as well as get some hands-on practice on determining various mechanisms and the chemical roles of various amino acids within the active site. Much as we just did in walking through this protease example. I'll see you then.